Welcome back to Night School, episode 002. We have, again, Mr. Wesley Shantz with us. Welcome, Mr. Wesley Shantz. Hello. And for the second time, we are going to be discussing Edgar Allan Poe's Raven. And as promised, since we gave sort of a global view of the mythological, psychological symbolism and sort of overview of the tone, um, pace of the poem, and um, uh, deep, pragmatic meaning of it, for any human who listens to it. Now we're going to give a close analysis of each stanza going uh, line by line, word by word, and sort of doing what a good literary lecture is, which is amplifying, uh, um, amplifying the images that we find here in order to find this sort of essence of, of not only the words used, but the, the, the lines and to move through to the heart of the poem, um, uh, going inside out. And so, well, Ms. West, the chance, so shall we start at the very first stanza? Yeah, um, we'll take turns reading this time. How about cool. that? I'll, I'll, I'll read the first one. Uh, I'm trying to get into the kind of the mindset of the, um, the opening line. It's just, it's just great. Okay, here it goes. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more." Well, excellent reading, Wes. And I immediately have a million amplifications pop into my mind. Do you mind if I just go? Go for it. All right, so it starts with sort of a mythological folktale motif, right? Once upon a midnight dreary. So we have not only the once upon what that expects once upon a time like a fairy tale and thus like a hero story, but we see an immediate inversion of that. Not once upon a time with like uh, the sun shining or rising, image of consciousness and the, the becoming of the hero, but a midnight dreary, the opposite. Uh, an image of the unconscious, the middle of the night when um, strange and unknown things happen rather than uh, things becoming known. The, the darkness that does not belong to Simba in the uh, Disney's Lion King. And so you even have sort of this stilted language in this as if this is a piece of forgotten lore, as if this is a page from the volume of forgotten lore, which, um, which Poe is speaking about. He uses words like ponder, dreary, um, quaint, curious in mm. and, and odd ways. It, the language here I would, I would describe as quaint and curious, not natural in any sort mm -hmm. of way. Um, mm -hmm. And then going in with the full theme of the poem, uh, in the first stanza is the idea that anomalous information is making itself known, and at first one doesn't know exactly how to take it. Indications are that it could that it could produce hope, uh, or or in, in the hope of being a promising piece of anomalous information, or that it could produce dread or anxiety, and that it is a negative piece of information. Which uh, there are indications already because of the fact that this is midnight, and this guy is uh, in a state of half unconsciousness that potentially. Potentially, this is going to be something that takes him by surprise and a negative surprise at that. So, um, and that I do think is ultimately what the entire meaning of the poem is. And so, um, right, yeah. right. The, the let's see the the way that you said that this itself becomes a kind of curious and quaint uh, piece of literature. Doesn't that then put you in the place of the speaker? right? You are the one now reading such a volume. And in a way, the raven, right, the title, it's already announced itself to you. It's already kind of rapping on the chamber door of your consciousness now. So you get this kind of um, immersion in the feel of the poem. And I think, like I said, from that very first line, which has become so iconic, once upon a midnight dreary, right? You're, you're thrust into the space the headspace of the poem and the narrator, the, the speaker. Um, and what happens next is really, really interesting that you, you, you get this kind of um, narrative thrust of there's someone at the door, right? Or so he thinks it might be. And then you take off for two full stanzas, um, he doesn't respond to the knocking on the door except in his own head so do you want to is there more in the first stanza you want to say or do you want to go ahead into the second here i would just say that if one wanted to give a very ungenerous nassim taleb or jordan peterson style um comment on the contemporary intellectual or academic traditions in the humanities and social sciences that one could uh, sort of ungenerously um 
interpret this as a description of a modern intellectual who is <laughs> tempted to hide away in a volume of forgotten lore, himself trying to be forgotten, weak and weary, and not not accepting the 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 torch for these times, not accepting mm -hmm. the hero's journey out, not accepting the anomalous piece of information that needs to be digested by the leading minds of today. Um, uh, that would be the last thing I would say about that um, as sort of an advanced crit criticism that I don't necessarily put forward, but can totally see and verify. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can see how it's borne out as we go along. It's an interesting, an interesting read. So go for it. Yeah. Ah, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. All right, so ah, and it, or please, since I, I spoke it, why don't you why don't you go first, Wes? Yeah, well, I the well, first thing I noticed about it is the. Um, the way the lines push against one another, to look at it from a kind of structural point of view, you have those uh, those dashes, at least I, I'm looking at a little book since it's really small on my screen, but all those dashes that give this um, kind of impetus, and there's uh, they appear at the, begin um, the middle, rather, and the ends of the lines. Uh, and you can interpret that a few different ways, right? Like, so it's like either his mind is rushing along, right? as he's kind of reminiscing um, and getting back into his emotions at the time, or instead of rushing along, it's more like this kind of fluttering back and forth yes. where he can't, he can't string a thought together as, or as ornate as his language is, it's anything but clear, like what he's trying to say, his syntax is quite tortured and partly that's the, the verse, the meter and the rhyme scheme that he's imposed in that first stanza. Um, but it's, I mean, it's quite a tour de force that he's able to do it at all, like all these rhymes, um, this bizarre meter. Um, and so the punctuation then kind of pushing against that to help the reader figure out what it is he's trying to say, I find pretty interesting here. Yeah, as Carl Rogers would say, there's an inauthenticity to the language. That I think that's precisely what makes it quaint or curious, right? That something is quaint that has had conscious attention paid to its elaboration, but not necessarily to improving its function, clarity. And so there's a, there's a dishonesty to how he expresses himself that, do, that, uh, that keeps him from manifesting or articulating the fullness of his experience. Um, there are certain boundaries that are placed upon his language artificially that uh, fail to encompass the fullness of his being. Uh, to express it sort of high, in a Heideggerian way. But I like that you mentioned the punctuation and how important th that is in the, the four dashes and the fact that they're not APA accepted, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but then again, we also have the language aspect. Again, this language of paleness, of sort of being a shade or a shadow or half alive, just like dreary or pondered weak and weary. We have this vapid image, quaint, nearly napping, these lukewarm images. We have a bleak December, again, that's sort of like like or, or light, uh, weak light, lacking mm -hmm. light, right? Bleak like his consciousness, like his future, like his very existence. And again, what sort of word do we have here? Dying ember. Dying embers for, indicate uh, decadence, descent, ghost mm -hmm. upon the floor. It leaves its ghost, it, and it's a dying ember leaving its ghost on the floor. That's not a very strong impact. Um, but you have yeah. that imagery of ghost and bleak. It's, it's very much like Booth Rotom from book three of the Aeneid, a, a place that's lost in the past. It has a river named Xanthos, named after Troy's powerful Xanthos that almost drowns Achilleus um, and, is, and is bathed in blood. But this, this river in Booth Rotom is dried up. I always ask the students, I'm like, why is the river dried up? What does that mean? Because poetry always means something, because we always mm -hmm. communicate to express something to each other, unless we have silted language like this guy. But even so, he still communicates with us. And so what, um, what it means, what the students tell me, is that you can't live in the past. There's nothing to drink there. There's nothing to eat there. It doesn't exist anymore. You can't, you can't subside there. And so insofar as this man is living in the past, his existence is ghost-like. And we have the reason, it seems, at least at first, like a Beatrice, a Lenore, a woman, mm -hmm. a woman lost, who is radiant now. That means full of light. That means an image of, 
of holiness. And then right after whom the angels name Lenore, and again, a connection with death and heaven, as if in her going to heaven through dying, he has been thrust into hell like a dying ember on the floor. He has gone down as she has gone up. Very Dante-esque. Mm-hmm. Nameless yeah. forevermore. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even even if he's wishing for the morrow, right? Even if he's wishing for the day to come, it's not because he has hope for the future. It seems to be just because he wants to get out of this, as you say, this terrible night of the soul, right? Where he's he's unable to get any um, consolation from his books. Uh, all he feels is this repeated sorrow, sorrow, right after, like one word after the other uh, for Lenore. He names her a couple times, but then claims that she's nameless here forevermore, which I guess we're to take it to mean that, you know, she's no longer here. She's no longer subject to be addressed, right? Mm -hmm. She she no longer has being. She is now part of the nameless many, the shades of Mm -hmm. the shadow realm. Um, Yeah. Now, there there is um, the name, though, like it emphasizes the name, and the name is one that Poe uses in other works i don't know his whole work that well but i know that it's a name that has a great resonance for him as an author and so i think it'd be important to kind of like look at what the name might mean but know that its meaning is in some sense determined by poe himself you know so you can't i think this is a a mistake that sometimes you might make i think you mentioned that you're your friend who, your coworker who taught this, you know, tried to bring something in from another work of Poe's where he said something about his work. And so it's, it's really difficult, even if it's from another work by the same author, to bring in something from outside the poem to try to, to explain what it might mean. I think, you know, just, just as a kind of method uh, point, that that's something to kind of watch out for. But, well, all think- right. I think that's a fair point, and I, I hope I hope he does listen. I hope he actually comes on and helps us at some point since he teaches this poem. That'd be yeah. I think that'd be good fun. And so, uh, yeah, are you are you ready to move on to the the next one? Yeah. So, um, and the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating. To some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is and nothing more. All right, so something I meant to say about the last stanza, and I'll, I'll move right back on to here, is that, again, I see elements in the second stanza, again, of dying and of decline, as this being sort of an anti-hero's journey or, or an, uh, a path of Cain or Lucifer or fall or decadence story or a... a a time when a hero has a choice or a person has a choice to either accept anomalous information and walk the path of the hero and produce, say, a new worldview based on that information uh, that thus acts as um, something that others can imitate through narrative and thus embody, um, but, or that it can turn negative, when, like a Jonah story or a Cain story where one, one resentfully or, or just where one consciously refuses to walk the path of the hero, to integrate the new information. One runs from it. One allows the snake to become a dragon. And that that is what's happening here. But in this stanza, the first line is beautiful, first off. In the silken sad, a certain rustling of each purple curtain. You have that, You uh, um, uh, everybody knows this literary term, but that alliteration there, mm-hmm. uh, the silken sad, and the rustling, so it makes a rustling sound. And and you get sort of the sense of thrill that you had when you were a young person, uh, like reading where the wild things were on a summer night with the fan loudly blazing above your, or, or twirling and whirling like a gyre above your head. Mm. And and that, that sense of thrill that where the wild things used to produce in me, or, or the king of the cats story, where something just crazy happened. And it's so interesting. You, we have that sort of moment here. Thrilled mm-hmm. me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. And even though it's talking about terrors, it's, it's exhilarating the language. So then now, to the still beating of my heart, where 
heart beating. I said repeating. And then we have him um, in a very unscholarly way, or well, in a scholarly way, use indirect discourse, but in an unscholarly way, produce his own story or his own version of the story. So actually, I guess it is ultimately a very scholarly because it's not an independent work, but it's <laughs> something that's actually there. I, I don't mean to be on this tip, but I, I've just read the first chapter of Nassim Tlaib's Anti-Fragility. And um, he, he, he's a businessman. And he has something to say about scholars which is very interesting because we sort of find ourselves occupying a middle place in, in, in that uh, category. So I suppose we can laugh at ourselves and, and at others uh, very genuinely. But so um, we have the dashes again, and um, that's, that's pretty much all, all I have to say. He's recapping the situation for us and the sense of uh, sort of thrill enters the poem for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. And again, it seems like we're getting a better sense of his, Again, like the way that his mind sort of works, right? He's in a real low place, but he does seem to be trying to muster some kind of emotion here, right? Uh, of although it might be terror, you know, it's something, right? It's um, it's not this uh, state of dissipation that he started out in, um, and and the the use of these repetitions is becoming more and more insistent, I think. Um, and you might ask sort of like why he's repeating that to himself. Is he trying to convince himself at this point that it's just some visitor? Is he hoping against hope that it's not just some visitor, but that it's Lenore, right? Like this, this fixed idea that he's got. That's excellent. And that makes me think of the fact that he is there alone. And that, again, another dissipated image, like a shade, is that of Echo, mm. who becomes her voice, which can only repeat and imitate. And so since he has no interlocutor, no true interlocutor, no Lenore, no second, no wife, no person to imitate and bounce things back with and to have a relationship with based on all that, he, he has only himself. He has only the echo of himself. And so he just repeats himself. And, uh, you know, there's no relationship in repetition. Isn't that why that, that children's game of just uh, saying exactly what your older sibling says is so annoying? What is that game <laughs> called again? Mimic? or something like that. Sure. Or just say all the same things that the older person does and they say, stop imitating me eventually. And that's the goal of the game, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what the Raven's about to do to him, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, good point, yeah. So do you have more on this particular stanza? No, no, we're good to go. All right. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door. That I scarce was sure, I heard you, here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Nice. So, yeah, there's a definite uh, shift here, right? He's, he's fine taking an action um, about this knocking that he heard at the door and so the the plot moves forward a little bit um, and the mystery deepens because you know there's darkness there and nothing more and at this point since we haven't said anything about it yet um, that weird half line that concludes each stanza I think seems to do something similar to what happens here at the end of the stanza in terms of the narrative where it's like you're expecting something more, like literally you've only got half a line. And so the poem is enacting through its structure the feeling that the narrator gets as he gets to the end of each of these stanzas, right? Where he, th there's this yearning, there's this, this yeah. lack that that's, is like physically there on the page, which is really cool. That's fascinating because it's almost as if that's w what that's saying is that we tend to perceive events in reality with a narrative structure and that moments like these uh, of discontinuity, as opposed to those continuity lines, those dashes we have, th these moments of discontinuity activate anomaly in our own beings, in our own essences, in our own minds. Yeah. And we as readers reading a narrative expect something to happen and then it does not. And that says something about how we perceive reality. Um, and so as we perceive this narrator, we perceive our own capacity or our own uh, uh, necessary framework of mind as narrative. We, because we expect more, we understand that we perceive with a narrative structure. We perceive reality with a narrative structure. Uh, yeah. 
why is there nothing there? Especially at this, because this is the moment of heroism, right? His soul actually grows stronger. And how does it grow stronger? Through no longer hesitating, but acting in the world. He's actually acting. Yeah. In fact, he gets up and he takes action and he articulates himself. He addresses the threat directly. He does it mm -hmm. with respect and he, he admits to his own flaw. He was napping. He was in this uh, dissipated state. And so now he's ready to put himself together. And then, bang, the issue is more complex than he expected. There's nice. complexity here. There's a, this is not one snake, but actually a bag of snakes. <laughs> because it's yeah. sort of a polyphemous moment, right? It's when Polyphemus yells, nobody is harming me. And then his, his, his uh, uh, sort of colleagues, but they're not colleagues because they don't live in a society together. The fellow Cyclopes say, oh, well, then the gods must be punishing you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which will interpret to be sort of like why we will let like sort of crazy homeless people be out on the streets um, is the same idea. Mm. We're like, well, the gods must be punishing them and we're going to give them a wide berth. And you can say that that's awful and I can say that they exist. And so there you go. Um, <clears throat> and again, yeah. it's a business perspective on it. If it is there, then it is a phenomenon regardless of our feelings about the fact that it exists. Maybe we can do something to address it. Maybe we actually can't, even though we try. Um, well, yeah, it's like, well, what does it mean to say that darkness is there? It's this, this insistence on the negative at the end of each of these stanzas. It's a, it's a statement about the notness or the nothing or the namelessness, right? So it's always asserting a negative. And, and that seems to be, well, you know, like a bit of a paradox, like a, a problem that's kind of insoluble or seems to be um, right. without some higher perspective that you can somehow get. If we take the framework of, uh, if we take the narrative framework of consciousness seriously, then, then when there is an absence where there's an expectation of an event or being being there, like a Lenore who's been lost, then that absence really is sort of palpable. It is real within the narrative framework. There is yeah. actually something that is missing. And perhaps that's what the, phen the phenomenon of feeling like something is missing is. That you actually have these roles within reality uh, based on the role you are playing within reality, all the world's a stage, as Shakespeare would say. And when there are pieces missing in your puzzle, you can actually feel that because of the narrative structure of your consciousness. Um, and so you have to populate your reality with that which uh, successfully populates your internal narrative. <laughs> and yeah, that seems to be what we're like getting, getting a hint at from these half lines that upset our expectation where nothing presents itself over and over again. So much so that we should expect it too, right? It this becomes the new pattern, yeah. Right, that seems to be the emotion that he works himself up into a thrill in like a Willie Loman, death of a salesman way, just to let himself down every time and perhaps that's hell. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps this isn't an image of hell. The raven and the raven comes to tell us that insofar as we are similar to him, we're in it. Uh, you know, uh, one thing funny about that, as a Poe is a romantic poet and obviously died in the gutter um, mm -hmm. at a fairly young age, uh, th that was the age in which people stopped reading the entirety of the Divine Comedy and started focusing only on the Inferno. <laughs> and it, it makes perfect sense to me, only uh, focusing on like the negative, the dissipated, the dark aspects of life. I wonder to what extent that's a reaction against uh, the terrible venereal diseases that were going around at that time, like syphilis, um, mm. that had a, a hand in shaping the Victorian era um, ethics of chastity. Um, so, yeah. I imagine I imagine it had quite an impact on the people who were directly uh, touched by it. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, as you know, Nietzsche would tell us. Yeah, I'm thinking of Nietzsche. <laughs> oh man! All right. All right. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. Mm. Then I, this I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, nearly this and nothing more. Okay, so we've got Echo explicitly said there, excellent, and the stillness gives no token, but dang, we have to talk about that second line. What a line. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a major focal point. We have, what, 
five D words right there. Major, major alliteration. Doubting, dreaming, dreams. No mortal ever dared to dream before. Mix that with the echo, the idea of something happening again, and then the merely this and nothing more, the fact that something doesn't happen again. You have Orpheus, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus, whose wife died on their wedding night, and he goes down to um, the underworld because he's the son of Apollo and a muse, that, and so he can sing really well on the lyre. And so he sings for Persephone and Hades, and they cry, and they give him back his wife with the condition that if he looks at her before they exit the past or Hades, indicating that she only exists in his past now, which is where people who die only exist after they die because their being is gone, uh, he will lose her forever. And of course, so he leaves the uh, vault of the past, his own memory or the collective memory, and she has to stay there because of course he lives in time and she, she now lives in eternity. Mm. Uh, and so I see that here, this merely this and nothing more with echo above that, we're, we're waiting for the echo. But the problem with the echo is it's a repetition again, right? Just like Lenore, Lenore. We're looking for that repetition, but what is a repetition but just a pale imitation? Like what this whole poem's diction is trying to, to strive for. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder to what extent, if we were literary scholars, we would say that Poe is saying something about his own style as a pale imitation, or something about the poetic art as a pale imitation of other poets, or of of, or as a pale imitation of a reality. Um, yeah. But I think yeah. that's a weak view of what it actually is. It's, it's a deeply pessimistic, yeah, um, but it's totally open to that interpretation. And, and one thing that I'm looking at here is in the second stanza, he has said, thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. And in the corresponding second line of the fourth stanza, now it's doubting dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. So he's really doubling down on the uniqueness of his experience here. And that's precisely the thing that in a way has sort of trapped him, right? He, his loneliness is, is tied to the same sense of solipsism or, or yeah, being, being caught uh, in, a, in a lost relationship and not being able to, 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 to pass on, to move on out of that. Um, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. If we wanted to take sort of a Dante perspective of perceiving Lenore as sort of an ideal or a lost ideal, if he's now disoriented in reality because of this anomalous information, then Lenore could be the ideal that poetry and romanticism had lost or that perhaps America at that time had lost and that we were becoming a pale imitation uh, we had uh, of ourselves of what we were meant to be, that we had lost our, our own sense of being, our own authenticity, and that um, now we were chasing a will-o'-the-wisp in the past as poets rather than striving towards the future. And so, again, that would be something I would be very much interested in getting further information on. Um, uh, to what degree he's being self-critical of his own mm -hmm. art and of his own contemporaries' art as well. Um, I mean, and this, this line that's so dismissive could just as well be said of his own poem in his own time, right? Merely this and nothing more. Right. This right. is it. This is it. This is the now. And, and it's like, exactly. I, I wonder to what extent he is so self-conscious. And I would also say I would hesitate to care too much about that to teachers of this poetry. To what extent an author is conscious of what they're doing it, you can give them sort of intellectual points for that. So like a Dante who's highly conscious of the structure of his poem and how he uses it. Um, you know, that obviously helps to broaden the consciousness of anybody who reads him. But the existence of specific words and themes in poems indicate even, I think, broader, uh, broader structural elements of human consciousness that are even more important than author authorial intent. That in fact, right. they, are, they, are, they are that which is taken for granted in a poem and idly placed can be even more important and telling than uh, the most, you know, the, the most well-structured straws and, and, and the most interesting, um, and the most interesting uh, uh, consciously articulated verbalizations. Um, so yeah, I would say that authorial intent is very interesting um, and fun as a game, but a sub game to what we're actually trying to do um, and mm -hmm. should not be fetishized. Um, this is, we are not trying to be Sherlock Holmes with Watson 
Um, or at least if you are, you need to get, you know, you need to access more information in order to do it appropriately and not just uh, interpret off the cuff, not assume that you understand the fullness and richness of the mind that you're reading, but that that, that mind is on the curriculum in order to fill you with its richness, not vice versa. Um, and that's why we also I right. think, don't indulge in just like simple criticism. You're trying to figure this stuff out. Um, and to label it beforehand is actually a cognitive distortion as we're finding out from reading Jonathan Haidt. <laughs> so we should, we should in inquire before we, we label. Okay, so I think we're at 30 minutes now. Do you wanna try and do one more stanza? We'll leave everything off for next time. Yeah, no, if we do one more, then we'll get to just before the raven actually uh, appears. So yeah, go for one, one more. All right, back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again, I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then where, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. So that's that's got to take the cake as the most contrived line, right? Um, to to get that rhyme to work, let me see then what thereat is. Yeah. Uh, to rhyme with the window lattice. I it's couldn't. It's beautiful it, right? in it a way. So it's, obnoxious. <laughs> it's awesome, um, but it's but it's such a stretch, right? Um, <laughs> and so yeah, he's really he's really grasping at straws. Like the narrator is, um, you know, his hope has been shattered and and he's yet again hoping wishing that it might still be true right that it's that it's her that she's back somehow uh that he has by his you know great virtue of study and and sorrow uh, attained to um to her to get her notice once more from the beyond you know beatrice like or something right but yeah, yeah but it's such a distorted such a distorted <laughs> version of that and it's sort of like he's waiting for his Dr. Faustus, Dr. Faust moment, right? And in the, the the great work Faust, what happens is this black dog jumps through the window, right? It, it This anomaly presents itself and it's the devil and it shows him the sensual life. And well, what we have here is his soul burning, right? An image of desire. He desires to investigate mm -hmm. the anomaly, to understand what's going on. But then when he, he attempts to, he, he doesn't know how. He doesn't have the tools necessary. He, he has the stilted prose and this ability to look as if he is investigating, but he does not know actually how to investigate the anomaly. To him, it presents itself as nothing and something at the same time, which is a logical, uh, it, which is logically invalid. It just can't, it can't, it cannot be true that there is something and there is nothing at the same time. We know that from all the way back to the Parmenides and Aristotle after Plato's work. Um, uh, you know, a man who does not accept the principle of non-contradiction is no better than a bush, which is what those become <laughs> in Dante's Inferno, which is interesting. Uh, uh, and so um, he, he has this stilted prose. He, unlike Dr. Faust, who then explores another part of life and expands his being, the sort of sensual, common, vulgar life, which he had not lived out, the sort of uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, actually, sort of life. This man's not even ready for that. He doesn't... <laughs> He doesn't, he looks out, but he doesn't see. It's as if he looks, but he does not see. Um, because this tapping is getting louder. And his desire, it, from an internal perspective, his desire is getting larger. From an external perspective, the tapping is getting louder. All the evidence indicates that something is there, and yet he remains completely blind to it. Except, tis the wind and nothing more, I think, is precisely the problem with, say, the scholarly interpretation as opposed to the true philosopher. Hmm. It is not the wind itself an indication? Is that perhaps what's being missed by the romantics? Is that perhaps what's being missed by the, the then naturalists who are giving nothing to the idea of divinity, which of course we know uh, the word for spirit, panuma in Greek, was also the word for wind and breath. Mm -hmm. And suke also meant wind, and uh, or rather anima, which would become anima or soul or animus and spirit in Latin. Well, that, that meant wind as well, ventus. Um, and so the wind 
is mythologically rich. The wind is what is first released in the very beginning of the Aeneid. The wind is there is the wind is what strikes Ulysses' uh, ship and shoots him back all the way to Aeolus's island. The wind is not mm -hmm. is not nothing. The wind is everything to a poet. The wind is even how you convey poetry. Yeah, right. With these breathless long lines, which I I think he's certainly pushing at the limits of his art in there many are. ways. And 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 one certain certainly powerful way to do that is to to question the very spirit of poetry, right? To say, "Tis the wind and nothing more." Is the wind and nothing more? That nothing more, though, I think, is highly subject to question. Again, and, and I mean, whether the question is whether he's actually pessimistic or simply in a Kierkegaardian way, sort sort of presenting himself as pessimistic to make a point, is less right. interesting to me than how, how is he wrong? <laughs> how, because "tis the wind and nothing more" strikes me as a mask you place over something that you hope somebody sees the cracks around. It's almost an invitation to interpretation, right? When you say something is nothing more, it's nothing more. You, you say something doesn't matter when you want somebody to stop paying attention because it does matter and you don't want to explain it. Right. As if he's leaving it to our explanation. He has this thinly veiled mask that we're supposed to look behind. It's like, tis the wind and nothing more. Maybe we should understand a little bit more about what wind is. Yes. Well, maybe we should. Um, well, we did a pretty good job there getting through like uh, six stanzas or so <laughs> in, in uh, a half hour. So. You know, yeah, and I think I, I, I'd say that, you know, as much as we're going to try and do, uh, I'd like to try and do the next few because that's so fun. How about, how do you feel about that, uh, part three? And then maybe we can move on if we don't do it all and sorry. Yeah, let's, uh, that's fine by me. I, I like it both ways, um, uh, but I also like the the principle of scarcity that there are a lot of poems we want to get to and you know sometimes we're not going to get through them all because we have a lot of interesting things to say and sometimes and we think this is part of literature sometimes we're not just going <coughs> to push through a text and uh, try and get through every little thing and identify every literary device but often we're going to try and amplify the images and show you just how deep a word or a line can be and how it can be historically uh, nested but also just um, psychologically nested within other concepts. And so part of poetry is just helping us to understand how humans perceive the world and what we find important. And that seems to be what poetry is a distillation of. Um, an even more refined and sophisticated and information rich uh, method of, of uh, articulation than normal speech. Uh, a fusion of art and speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think we appreciate that quite a bit and we would like to share that appreciation as well. So this is, you know, not only sort of coursework, but also I would say like adult sophistication work. Um, if, if you're somebody interested in literature and poetry and art or just interested in getting into it, I think this is exactly the series for you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, there is such a thing as people just reading because they really, really like it. Yeah. You know? Maybe not something that students often get to see or people actually have the time to do a lot of times, but yeah, it, it's worth um, doing just for the sake of doing it. Yeah, well, and I'm having a great time doing it with you, Wes, and just to let the listeners know, we, we are accepting donations on our respective anchor channels, and we are in talks to go to a conference, NorwestCon, and we are also in talks about how to make this a more full-time gig, and so you know, any support any that y'all have to offer, whether, you know, moral support or otherwise, we always appreciate it. We love doing this and we're throwing this out here as our gift to the world. Yes. Yes. All right. Should I, should I go on? <clears throat> um, are we, are we going on? We're at uh, 39 minutes now. Oh, okay. Well, next time then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next time. <laughs>